Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, if you are joining today, this uh, webinar is about government support for community composting, part three, and this one focuses on local government, cities and counties that have public-private partnerships in some way uh, with community composters or in some way supporting community composting, which is local composting. Um, so, uh, First, before we get started, I'd like to just introduce my staff today that's going to be helping with the webinar. I'm Brenda Platt with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I direct the Institute's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'm joined today by Sophia Jones and my colleague Sophia Jones and Clarissa Libertelli. Sophia is tech support and will be advancing the slides. Thank you in advance, Sophia. And Clarissa is our composting for um, Community Composter Coalition Coordinator. We have a lot of C's in our initiative, so that's just one of them. So thank you both. Uh, this wouldn't be possible without your help. Uh, shout out to our sponsors today, um, the uh, 11th Hour Project, part of the Schmidt Family Foundation is a big uh, funder of our community composting work here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And then also wanna shout out to Biobag, which is made uh, possible scholarships for a number of you to be able to join these series of, of webinars. This is one in a three-part series that we've uh, been doing on um, showcasing how local government is supporting community composting. The first one spotlighted just New York City, that was May 4th. Uh, Clarissa will be putting the links to the uh, recordings for that one, as well as the second one that we did earlier this month on featuring community composters or food scrap collectors that have municipal or county contracts. So check those out if you haven't already. Today, I'm pleased that we'll be focusing on uh, local government. So these are our five presenters today presenters today. Krista's with San Mateo in California. Sunny is with um, the city of Albany in New York. Ash is with Philadelphia Parks and Rec Recreation and obviously Philadelphia. Louisa is with Greenbelt, which is in Maryland. And Adam is with uh, Tompkins County in New York. And they are wearing different hats. So it'll be interesting to hear from them and their different perspectives because many of them are with different agencies. They're not just with public works, they're with sustainability or parks and recs, as I just mentioned. Um, let me just say before we get started, a few words about our initiative. Um, we, as part of the work we're doing, underpinning almost all of our work is kind of cultivating community composting or local composting within a community. So we are doing workshops, we have webinars, podcast, we convening this coalition that Clarissa's coordinating, we produce guides, we're doing policy resources, training, we have some videos. So uh, check out check out all these resources and plug in we would love to have more cities be members of our coalition. Uh, we welcome you if you've got a program you're already running. Uh, the next slide just shows, just gives a flavor of some of the other webinars we've been offering over a number of years uh, in this space. They range from everything about how to avoid rats at your site to equipment for small compost sites. We had a series last year just on on-farm composting. So uh, do check those out too. And uh, the other thing we launched earlier this year is an online certificate program that's geared just towards community composters, so Community Composting 101. It's an online course, certificate course. It's self-paced. Uh, we do have scholarships available if you need it. We don't want to turn anyone away, so uh, check that out. And we developed this to kind of meet that gap in training that you have some a number of cities, communities with master composter programs, all the way to certifying op operators at commercial industrial sites, but there really wasn't anything that addressed kind of the in-between sites. So that's why we uh, launched this program under our Neighborhood Soil We Builders Composter Training Program. We've been doing a number of graphics too and posters that are available. Some of these have been translated into different languages. We released this one last month during International Compost Awareness Week, How Composting Combats the Climate Crisis. So we hope that some of our graphics um, 
will be useful to you in your own work advocating for more composting. One of the ones that's more most popular that we have is our hierarchy to reduce waste and build community or grow community. And this kind of fits in with what we're talking about today. This one, by the way, has been translated into a number of languages, including Spanish. So, And it's available in different forms, as well as if you are interested in a PowerPoint version, we can make that available. But it's the only hierarchy that really looks at at, at the options for reducing waste, composting, food waste, that is, with the lens of local. So, of course, we have source reduction, rescuing edible food. But after that, for the residential materials generated, let's promote home composting. Then small-scale decentralized, whether it's composting or anaerobic digestion. So that's at schools, community gardens, local urban farms, um, et cetera. And then after that, you know, medium-scale Local, locally based, maybe at an on-farm, composting a little bit further out. And all of that should be part of how we think about infrastructure and developing um, a decentralized and distributed infrastructure, if you will, within our communities. And so most preferred to least preferred. But today, this series is really about how can we promote um, uh, small scale, locally based composting and how can local government support that? So that's what this series is about. Uh, we, um, and go ahead, Clarissa, or Sophia, you can go to the next slide. We have, um, uh, we're going to just do a poll here to see who's on the line today. So, and so let's run the poll. So what best descri describes your affiliation? You may fall into more than one of these buckets, but please select the best option. Are you a community composter? Are you a food scrap collection service provider? Are you with local government? Are you with state or federal government, or do you fall into a different bucket altogether? And when we have enough of you participating, we'll show the results. Okay, so almost half of you are with local government. Yes, we're so happy to have all of you here. State and federal government, community composters, food scrap collectors, and other, everybody is welcome. We had not only folks registered from something like 40 states, but also Germany, Australia, the UK, uh, New Zealand. So all are welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing is uh, this last year's we are running a have run a census survey of community composters. And um, one of the questions we asked was, what kind of public and or private sector assistance would be most useful to your operation? And this may be hard to see, but I just want to point out the peaks here, the ones where we got the highest percentage of people saying these things matter to them. And on the far left, you can see long-term access to land. That's something local government might be able to help with. Um, another peak is help with grant, grant writing assistance, so funding is always important, helping with supplies and equipment, investment, and then uh, policies to encourage composting is the tallest peak here. So we make the rules and the rules make us. So of course, whether it's zoning or local policies, a lot can be done on the kind of policy level to encourage community composting. So food for thought, and we will probably be offering more programming um, in these specific topic areas. So without further ado, let's get into um, uh, today's presenters and panelists. The way this is going to run is we have asked each presenter to present for about eight minutes, 10 at most. We're going to hold your questions to the end, So, but you can submit them into your go-to uh, webinar panel box, question box at any time and we will hopefully get to them. I will just tell you that we will focus on questions that deal with how local government can support community composting. So if your question is off topic, we may not uh, get to it. But let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Krista Kuhnhackel, who's the sustainability coordinator for the County of San Mateo in California. Krista has worked on recycling and waste reduction in local government for 20 years, and she's going to share with us a little bit about all the recycling and composting work that her office is pr promoting, but in particular, we've asked her to do a deeper dive on how the county is supporting the Community Garden Partnership Program, which in particular is supporting community composting. All right, Krista, the mic is yours. 
Hey, hello. <clears throat> so I'm Krista with the County of San Mateo Office of Sustainability, and I'm going to be talking about our composting resources that we have. Next slide. So we offer composting workshops and discounted or free compost bins or rebates for people who want to build their own bins and funding and support for community gardens to promote composting and funding for community composting hubs. Next slide. So we used to be Recycle Works over in Public Works with the County of San Mateo. And then in 2015, the Office of Sustainability was formed with these four different work groups. And I'm on the waste reduction team. And so we help people with all types of things um, for reducing, reusing, recycling, and or compost. And we also work with community and school gardens and provide grants. And then we have a building materials management program where we help people with their construction and demolition waste and have a deconstruction program as well and training and illegal dumping. Next slide, please. So in our composting education, we have home composting workshops. And in these workshops, we focus on hot pile, cold pile, vermicomposting, and they're offered almost monthly, and they're two hours, and they're virtual and in-person. And these pictures on the right are from just a couple of weeks ago at a workshop that we did at a elementary school in La Honda. We like to go out in the garden and where it's very inspiring, but also do it virtually, and because some people still are into in-person things. Um, and then we also have a master compost and solid waste course, which is a six week program and it's two hours each week. And that's for people who really want to learn more about composting. And so for the discounts and free bins, if people don't take a workshop, they get a $65 discount on these bins. But if they do take a workshop, then we provide these bins um, for free for taking the workshop and they're all about $145 value. And so they will get the soil saver with the base or a tumbler, which they pay $40 for because that costs more. And this is these bins are open to residents of San Mateo County or people who live or work in San Mateo County. And they're, they can get one bin per offer. Okay, next slide. And they can choose either the um, backyard type bin or a worm bin. And there's these two different ones. It depends on availability, which one they will get. Um, you know, everything's still kind of backed up because of COVID, um, but they'll get the bin and then a week later they'll get their worms. And just this just makes sure that they set up their happy home for the worms before they get the worms. Next slide, please. And then there's also discounts on accessories. They get a $15 discount. So for the worm bins, there's worm blankets or coconut core bedding blocks. And for compost bins, there's the compost aerator, which works well with the soil saver because it's hard to turn those and a compost thermometer and a stainless steel kitchen pail. Next slide. We also offer rebates for people who wanna build their own bins because uh, the bins on the market, eh, you know, so if people want to build one, then we um, promote them to use salvaged lumber and no treated lumber. And so they submit receipts for the materials and then they can get a rebate of up to 200. And we have bins for building these or um, plans for building these types of bins on our website. Next slide. So the community garden partnership program started in 2018 and we funded over 1550 gardens so far and we partner with schools, cities, nonprofits, community centers, churches, a jail and a homeless shelter. And we provide raised garden beds, soil, compost bins, garden tools, sheds, signage, etc. Next slide. And so the requirements are the garden or school or whatever needs to be located in San Mateo County and open to the public except for schools and resource centers and compost organic garden materials, maintain the vegetation and keep up with the compost bins and promote composting to garden members and visitors and display educational signage and informational brochures on composting. Next slide. This is an example of a sign that we have up in the gardens next to the compost bins. It just shows the composting process and what you can and can't put in there. Next slide. 
This is an example of a sign that we put in schools or at gardens if they have uh, worm bins. And we do have all these signs in Spanish and simplified Chinese as well. Next slide. And these are examples of our brochures that we have, how to make your own compost, composting with worms, and sustainable gardening and landscaping. And these are also all in Spanish and simplified Chinese. And in some cases, we'll do other languages, like we did them in Tongan for a church. Next slide. And this is just one example of a bin with the signage around it and the brochures and brochure holders. Next slide. Um, okay, and then there's, uh, this is an example of a school that we worked with in Daly City, Woodrow Wilson Elementary, and they don't have a lot of green space. So they just had this big open asphalt lot with a few planter beds. Next slide. And this is what they did with it. They set up all these garden beds and put mulch in the middle to make it feel like a real garden and added irrigation. So it just kind of shows you can put a garden anywhere. Next slide. And then there were Central Park in the city of Melbourne. And this was just a piece of parkland in one of their uh, parks in the middle of the city. Next slide. And this shows a volunteer day where everybody got together and helped fill the beds with soil. And uh, it's a beautiful garden now. I should have had pictures of that. But next slide. And this is a garden um, in Wahanda, the Cuesta Garden. And this was just a empty field next to tennis courts, and it's owned by the HOA. And this is what it looks like now. And so there were 21 beds put in, and um, they actually have, uh, and then there's a three um, bin compost system that was put in. And they, for this one, there was a shed added and gutters and a cistern to collect rainwater because there's no water source there. And then when the, um, the fire hydrants are flushed, then the water is put into the cistern. Next slide. And they have these beautiful art shows with people in the community. Wahanda is a very artsy community, so every year they put up new artwork in the garden. Next slide. And we also uh, partner with compost hubs. We provide funding to Fresh Approach uh, to set up and maintain composting hubs. And the community compost members, they complete an online training, and then they're given a green five-gallon plastic bin to collect their weekly food scraps. And then they return their food scraps to the farmer's markets in exchange for usable garden compost and produce vouchers to purchase local fruits and vegetables. Next slide. And there's two locations in East Palo Alto and the College of San Mateo in the city of San Mateo. And this is just a picture of what it looks like when you show up there. You get a green bucket and you exchange it for a full bucket of compost and get vouchers. Next slide. That's it. So if you have questions, we have a toll free number or you can find out more on our website. And I'll be around to answer questions after. Thank you, Krista. That was, that was amazing. And I love the signage and um, and the uh, and then that to, to highlight access to parkland, some of the things that San Mateo is doing. We can get more into that in the discussion. So reminder to folks, uh, feel free to uh, type your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel um, as we go, and we will get to them. So let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Sunny Von Tiedemann, who's a recycling specialist with the Department of General Services in uh, the city of Albany in New York. Since 2019, he has been uh, in that position. And during his time with the city, he's planned and implemented Albany's uh, community composting program. So Sonny, the mic is yours. Great, thank you. Thanks for the <clears throat> introduction. And um, thank you to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance for inviting me to present. Uh, yeah, so I'm the uh, recycling coordinator and now the composting specialist for the city of Albany, which is located uh, about halfway in between Montreal and New York City. Uh, we're a city of about 100,000 residents. Um, and sometime back in 2019, we received a grant from the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. And the grant was designed to focus on uh, community composting, food waste reduction, and uh, food donation. 
So <clears throat> right off the bat, we kind of wanted to put something together that was going to uh, give City of Albany residents uh, as many options as possible to divert their food waste. Uh, due to uh, funding restrictions, we weren't able to put together something that was going to be like a curbside collection, uh, kind of like what they have in New York City. But we figured that the best approach would to be would be to have a backyard composting program, um, as well as uh, designated community compost drop-off sites. And then we also partnered with several local um, not-for-profits that that offer a pickup service. So you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Thanks. So one of the most critical components of our programs, which really uh, made them successful, was our partnerships. Luckily for the city government, there are already several organizations um, throughout the city that were doing composting uh, production and compost education, as well as other environmental education. So I kind of just tapped into the work that they're already doing and offered um, as much support, whether it was funding or tools uh, or even staff from our own office, myself included, to help them um, continue the mission that they were already already on. So we hired the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center, which is a nonprofit located in the south end of Albany, which is an environmental justice community. And they came on board as our, our education coordinator. So they run workshops at all the local schools. Uh, they have workshops at their, um, their urban farm, which is located right in the city. Um, and they also offered us a community drop-off site. So we have signage there that kind of, you know, tells people what can and cannot go in uh, the bins, um, as well as, you know, tells them to put some wood chips on top uh, and a couple other tips just to help with the uh, the Radix staff when they when they collect the materials. Uh, in addition, Radix also offers a food scraps pickup service. So this is a true curbside collection service that they offer for a, a pretty small fee, but it's a monthly pickup service where their customers get a bin, which the city um, the city pays for. So the city pays for the bin, and then they pay, they set up a, a weekly schedule or monthly schedule with the uh, with the resident to pick up their food scraps. We also partnered with uh, Food Scraps 360, who offers the same service, a, a pickup subscription. Uh, and they're hopefully in the near future going to come on board as a um, as another drop off site. In the city of Albany, we have a ton of vacant lots, so it provides ample opportunity for any organization or any resident for that matter to take over a space and kind of set up a drop off site or a community garden, which is which is kind of nice. Um, in addition, we partnered with the Friends of Tivoli Preserve, who um, offered a space for us to do uh, another drop off site. They're also located in a uh, an environmental justice community. So the success of the program, as I said, was really mostly in, uh, you know, in part due to our partnerships with these organizations. We, we had the funding, but we just didn't have the staff or the presence that the that these organizations had. So we felt like it was about time for us to not only recognize their work, but to also help them financially and with whatever else they needed to, to you know, to help us get this program off the ground. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is an overview of the three options uh, that I discussed earlier. So the backyard composting option is um, just for residents who have a backyard or renters or or owners, doesn't matter who, um, and they get a free backyard composting bin. Right now we're working uh, with earth machines because they were the most uh, cost effective option at the time, but we are looking into doing um, some DIY uh, compost bins as well in the near future. Um, so in addition to the earth machine, they also get a kitchen scraps bin for, you know, to collect their food scraps in the kitchen. They get a five gallon rounds bucket. So we provide uh, wood chips when we first set up the bin for them. We come to their house and kind of set up the bin and go through how it works and just the basics of uh, backyard composting. And they get a browns bin, which they can then take down to our composting facility and pick up wood chips whenever, whenever they need. And it's open. Um, from April through to September. And then there are also winter hours as well. 
Uh, and in addition to the actual physical materials, they also get uh, a brochure. Um, and then we have a phone number that they can call in at any time if they have questions about um, their backyard compost bin or, or composting in general. Uh, the second option, as I mentioned, was the community drop-off option. So anyone participating in that in that option gets a free kitchen scraps bin, as well as as well as education materials, and they have free access to any of the compost drop-off sites, which are open 24/7. Uh, and the way we're able to do that is because, like I said, our partner organizations are there 24/7, so they can maintain um, the sites without the city having to commit, uh, you know, at least staff. We do, you know, we do provide some tools and and the bins and the signage, and hopefully in the near future we're also going to be providing uh, funding for their staff time to do collection and processing. Uh, and then the third option is the pickup service. So. Radix, as I mentioned, and Food Scraps 360 offer a monthly pickup service, and the city subsidizes the cost of the bins. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the future of the program, where one of our main objectives is to uh, increase the number of drop-off locations we have, not only with uh, local nonprofits, which there are several others uh, in the city that, that we're looking to partner with who have community gardens or who have a space where they do environmental education. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we had the funding available to, you know, compensate them for this work because it is, it is a lot of work. Um, in addition to that, we're looking to potentially have some um, curbside collection units. They're, they're actually doing this in, uh, Lower Manhattan and in Astoria, Queens, they have these kind of smart bins which use a card technology and people can, as long as they have the card or a, a phone app, they can use the bins 24-7. So we're, we're looking to hopefully, you know, bring that online as well. Um, the, the eventual end game is we're going to try to tie this program into a soil remediation project in, in the environmental justice communities in the city. Um, the idea being that the funding and the support that we give to the, the drop-off partners, they can provide us with some finished compost that we can then use to help remediate soil in, in these neighborhoods and hopefully to assist you know, local residents in creating their own community gardens in their backyards because as many of you I'm sure are aware, these communities are food deserts as well. So that's, that's another problem that we're trying to tackle through, through these programs. Um, right now we're working on a, uh, a workshop, um, for vermicomposting and, and Bokashi for residents who, you know, live in apartments. There aren't too many, but we want to make sure that we, uh, address anyone and everyone in the city, no matter what their particular situation is. So, so far in the program, we've had about 700 backyard composters sign up. So that's 700 residents, uh, with a backyard composting bin. And as a part of the program, we asked them to uh, report their usage on a week-to-week -week basis. So through the reporting form, we've diverted, I think it's about 60 or 70 tons so far. And that also includes uh, materials dropped off at the, uh, or food scraps dropped off at the drop-off locations and the food scraps that are picked up by our partner organizations. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thanks, Sonny. Um, really love how you're emphasizing when you keep it local, that finished compost is coming back to the community in which that, those food scraps are being generated. So um, lots to talk about there too. Um, let me introduce our next speaker while we're bringing up Ash's slides. So Ash, Welcome, Ash Richards is the Director of Urban Agriculture for Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. Uh, before joining that department, they worked for the City Planning Commission doing comprehensive and place-based planning and at Parks and Recreation, Ash is working to support the self-determination and com community power of residents, farmers, and gardeners. So it's nice to see how your work is sitting at the nexus of that policy and planning and the programs and civic engagement. So Ash, um, the mic is yours. Thanks, Brenda. I'm actually gonna 
time myself to make sure that I'm on time. So um, thanks everybody. Um, and thank you, Brendan, for the invitation or the um, sort of uh, introduction and thank you to Institute for Local Self-Reliance and also my co-presenters uh, for inviting me to this great meeting. So I'm gonna to present to you all on um, what we do here in Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to very quickly give you a little taste of Farm Philly, which is where our compost programs are couched in at Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. And I think just essentially overall, I'm going to present to you all how Parks and Recreation is taking an approach to food waste at a small, medium and large scale approach. Um, and just really quickly, Philadelphia as an entire city is an EJ community, an environmental justice community. And so uh, waste and dumping, environmental pollution and, and landfills are a really big deal for us. And so these are really grassroots community oriented approaches to food waste. So hopefully you enjoy it. Next slide. So um, first things first, our mission. Uh, so this is really important to us. Our mission, as Brenda was uh, mentioning before, at Farm Philly is to really connect residents to the natural world. Uh, we'd love to provide opportunities for physical activities while supporting the self-determination and sovereignty of communities to grow their own food. Compost is a part of that, right? And so we do provide programming and material support for gardens and farms, but we also do a whole lot more uh, in regards to some of the supplemental materials that gardeners and farmers might need, which include compost, uh, amongst other things, or mulch and things like that. And I'll get into that later. Next slide. We have four goals at Farm Philly. Uh, first and foremost, we want to support residents and communities to design and lead their own agriculture projects. And so agriculture projects can include farms, gardens, goats, beehives, um, we have people who raise quail in Philadelphia, all kinds of things, all kinds of activities, and we certainly want to support them. And so we define those support systems very clearly for residents so that they know uh, what uh, materials that we can uh, bring to them or show how we show up for essentially residents who are trying to do the work. Next slide. So goal two is, in addition to that, we want to make sure any resources that we're creating or generating are equally redistributed amongst our communities, especially those who have been impacted by historical and ongoing disinvestment, food apartheid, or displacement. Next slide. Goal three, we want to ensure that if there's any food that's being produced on public land, including parkland, that that food uh, gets equally distributed amongst our residents. And last but not least, Next slide, we want to of course commit to food policy and development. So we're talking about compost today. Compost includes a lot of policy, so I'm gonna get into that later in my uh, presentation, but essentially we really wanna make sure that we elevate agriculture, including compost, uh, as a permanent and viable productive land use in our city. So first things first, what are we doing on sort of the small scale? And how are you reaching residents uh, on that level? So in 2019, um, we developed a program called the Community Compost Network. We were able to be very much so influenced by the work that's going on in Washington, D.C., where their parks uh, department also created a community compost network. And essentially what this program is, is that we develop composting bins, supports and materials, education training, and uh, elect different sites in the city that apply to then disband all of these materials to them and they essentially have their own composting operations. Thus far, we have 13 sites. Our goal is to get up to 25 sites and these systems are located at gardens and schools, farms, uh, and in the future, we hope to open that up to places of worship. Essentially what is involved is a two by or 12 by four by four compost bins, all the essential materials and supplies, education materials and training that we provide to our residents. Next slide. So the goals for this program, uh, so we, one, want to build capacity of residents to engage in composting. Uh, we want their sites to be resource hubs for community-led waste diversion. We also want to support residents and neighborhoods to reduce their waste and increase their cycling rates, recycling rates. So this is, in addition to composting, we're also trying to have conversations about waste and litter, for example, in some of the neighborhoods, which has been, and dumping, which has been an incredible uh, issue in Philadelphia for decades, and doing all of this in a very grassroots way. 
Third, we want to share best practices for management and collective composting system. And fourth, uh, we also want to collect that data and see how uh, you know, we could use that to politically um, ask for more funding if we can show that we're actually making an impact or a dent on waste in our city. Next slide. So in order to do this program, we essentially have a lot of partners. Parkour PHL helps us build all of our bins. Institute for Local Self-Reliance, shameless plug, supports us with education and training. And we also partner with our local food policy council. And that has been really great for us because we've been able to connect with them a lot on the policy end. Next slide. These are, this is a very simplified map of where all of our sites are. And the reason why I show this is because geogra geography is important, right? Um, it's an application-based system, so we're not, you know, but we, we realize that we're not really addressing the South Philly area. And so in our next application pool, we're going to definitely make sure that we um, potentially do some door knocking to get folks to sign on to, um, in South Philly, to sign on to the program so we're reaching every area of the city. And the next slide, these next few slides are just literally just pictures of the training, how it went. So when you get uh, inducted into our program, you go through um, required training. And this is really important to us uh, because we need folks to understand how to do the project and how to do it well and how to maintain the space. Um, these are residential areas. And so, you know, having uh, pests or different types of nuisances associated with the compost bins don't go over very well when you're doing this in residential areas. So getting trainings is key. Next slide. So here you see, uh, you know, we have a full class of folks uh, learning how to do composting 101. Next slide. We also invite folks to come back and ask for more workshops throughout the year, hence the network, right? So once you get in, it's not end all be all we continue to work with folks continue providing technical assistance next slide these are just pictures of folks training at our one of our farm facilities and learning how to do composting this is a donut method of composting uh, and so they're getting that training firsthand next slide partnerships for the win if you do not have the funding to do your work which we were really operating on a two string budget you have to get partnerships. And that is, I can't stress that more than enough. Um, and so we built the bins together with our partners. So everyone involved in the project can understand how these bins work. And they're very heavy and they need to be assembled on site because they're virtually unmovable if you assemble them and then try to move them. So little things like that we're learning. Next slide, right? So we're learning with our, with PowerCore PHL how to do it. Next slide, you just keep going through. Next slide of how to do that, there's beautiful people there. Um, and so in addition to the bins, what else do we give folks? At no cost, the bins are at no cost, you don't have to pay for them. Uh, we also gave all of these list of materials for free as well, uh, because we need to give them materials for success. And we also don't want the same shovels that they're using to garden. We don't want them to use those same shovels for compost because of bacteria, et cetera. So we want to make sure that we're setting them up for success. And that includes giving them material, actual literal material support, not just education. Next slide. Great. So if you don't get into the program, we also, uh, parallel to this program, have developed um, I, I'm at eight minutes, so I'll try to wrap up. We also co uh, developed um, a compost manual. Uh, this will be available to any resident and also anyone in the country who's interested in developing a compost manual. So if you want to do composting community oriented, this manual will help you do that. The manual is going to get released sometime next month. So um, I'm sure if you stay in touch, we'll be able to plug you in and get you to that. Um, next slide. Um, so challenges and deep dives. So really quickly, the successes of this program is that we're making a new resource where residents can benefit from. And also a little goes a long way. We have a multiplier effect, right? So if we are uh, decentralizing our composting efforts in into neighborhoods, not just at one municipal facility, we're able to reach a whole lot more people and have more of a multiplying effect in how much people are getting involved directly in food waste diversion. It works, right? And community residents can have control over the process. There are challenges though. First challenge being is funding. If you don't have the funds, and I think folks mentioned this before to you know, compensate your collaborators, then you really need to can reconsider your project start date. Um, I highly recommend that you, know, you should try to pay for a lot of the materials upfront and try to have partners build it for you for free. Parkour PHL needs to train youth on workforce development, and so they need projects. Great, why don't you build the bins for us? Perfect, now they're learning about composting and waste and also um, 
craft skills. And so they can take those skills and, and move into their next uh, level of career. Challenge two is a learning curve, right? So if you're starting a program that is city funded but community led, it requires everyone to be on the same page about operating and how do we maintain it and how are we engaging residents about it, right? And of course, challenge three with operations. Uh, planning for operations is key. So if you're gonna have community partners lead the project, how are they gonna operate? We can't just tell the city of Philadelphia, hey, if you want to drop off food waste, here are the sites. They will be inundated, right? And so each site has to decide what is their operating model? Are you gonna be a cooperative model? Are you going to be a worker-owned model where you have to work and also um, you know, take care of the system and manage it. And if you're not going to do that, you can't be a part of it, et cetera. Or do you have to pay to be a part of it? So each site gets to decide what's their operation model. So I'm at time. Um, we have, I have two, the, the medium and large, I didn't realize it was going to take so long to get through these uh, slides, but Ash, here is it's something. okay. I think, yeah. I think what I wanted Ash to do was also talk about how the city has um, issued an RFP and awarded a contract to a local composter. So please continue that. and cover through. that, Ash. You're good. You got it. You got it. So I'll be very haste. Uh, so this slide is essentially um, our bins in action. This is Brewery Town Garden. So you see the bins that we provided on the right, and then they have their operation to the left. They're saving their leaves to the back, and they're sifting their compost, and they have different types of pile. I'm telling you, if you can train people and give them the tools to do it, it works. And so this is an example of that. The project that um, Brenda wants me to talk about is the next slide, private, uh, the public-private partnership. So what we did in Philadelphia, this is the medium scale now, right? So the streets department is responsible for municipal waste. And in order to have a whole new composting residential pickup system, you have to get a new fleet. You have to get new crews, train them. You have to also have a site that will be able to do that. So those three huge components, that's a lot of funding. Our streets department and in our city, you know, a lot of our agencies are strapped for cash. How long do we have to wait in order for them to get all the money to do those three components? The answer is, well, maybe we don't have to wait. Maybe there's, a, again, another decentralized approach to this. So the, hence the public-private partnership. In 2020, we put out a RFP for a private business to start collecting separated food waste for us specifically in our rec centers. So this is not residential yet, but at this moment, it's just for rec centers. Each year for five years, they'll collect from about 20 to 30 rec centers. Philadelphia has 157 recreation centers. The goal is at the end of five years to collect from all of those rec centers. Bennett Compost went out for the bid and they got it, right? And so we give Bennett Compost the land and the utilities to operate, and in return, Bennett Compost will give us 20 tons of nutrient-rich compost to go back into our farm Philly programs and gardens, right? And so the program is estimated to do about 267 tons of food scraps and 400 tons of browns that are going to be processed annually. And of course, um, there's a lot of successes to this. We're unlocking capacity issues, so we don't have capacity to do this at a city at Parks and Rec, right? but we do have capacity to do this with a partner. And so there is definitely a big public benefit to this, which has to be a part of your project. If you're looking to do this with a, a private partner, they're going to make money, right? So they're gonna be collecting waste and they're gonna run their private business. So you have to make sure that there's an understanding that there has to be a big multiplier of public benefit to the project, which in this project there is. They are going to take our food waste, which is gonna save us a lot of money. They're also going to generate compost, which is also gonna end, deliver it, which is also gonna save us on operations having to do that as well. So there's an opportunity to educate a lot of communities and youth who are dumping their food into these buckets for, for uh, Bennett Compost, and it's really a model uh, for replication. I, I wanna get to the last slide of this, but first four pictures of what this looks like. So this is a regular regular utility building that happens to be on Parks and Rec land that we didn't necessarily need. So this is where we are feed it out, and now Bennett is, this is Bennett's, one of Bennett's new home stations. Next slide. They have all different kinds of infrastructure in here that they had to pay for and we supported them on, which is, you know, you know, uh, baggers where they're bagging up their compost uh, so they, they ship it out uh, to residents and also ship it out to us. And then next slide, uh, they did a lot of fundraising. We went for grants at the um, EPA and USDA for the composting um the composting cooperative agreements so that we could build bays, et cetera, for them. And next slide, these are just pictures I I'm talking to 
my people here, so you might find these interesting. Most people won't, but essentially, uh, we have been able to um, move a lot of material to and fro from this site. Next slide. So really quickly, because I, I think this is really important, is the challenges. And the, so again, what are the strengths? Mutual partnerships, unlocking capacity, scale and scalability. We'll be able to have this decentralized approach to the sort of small scale, medium scale doing this. And we're really also solving a waste diversion issue. So we don't have the funding to do it on a municipal level with streets department, but we can do it with a partner. Um, and then, of course, this has a, is a model to be kept that we can be replicated on all fronts. There are challenges. The first challenge is funding and timing. So even though we could provide utilities in the land, we definitely had needed funding to do fencing for security. We needed funding for concrete slabs. We needed funding to sort of um, to update the buildings, right? So to make it conducive to this type of work. And so we had to make sure that we did grants with the USDA and the EPA to get that done. The timing, the city contract process for Philadelphia for RFPs, and it might be similar to your municipalities and your cities, we only can do one year uh, contract renewals. So you RFP, so you can't just select a, a, you know, a, a private business, you have to RFP it out, that takes time, and then uh, you only get one year renewals. So Bennett, thinking we want to invest in this, it's difficult for them to have faith in a process that says, every year you, you're up for renewal. We wish we could give them a 10-year contract, but that is not the legislated rules of our city. So it essentially, you have to have build trust with your partner in order to get them through that process. Because if you're a business, you might not be sleeping at night if you had one-year renewal contracts for something that you're investing so much money into, right? They're doing site improvements, they're putting in you know concrete work, bays, et cetera. Challenge two, Influencing state regulations. I don't know about you all, but in PA, our compost permit is for very large scale composting. So we're in the conversations right now with the DEP, uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, to essentially for them to reconsider the uh, composting permit on our state level and to do a small scale composting permit or what we're going to call the PA urban composting permit. To change this permit for a smaller scale is going to be huge. And I think if we get it, which I think we will hopefully, it will literally set a precedence, I think, for the rest of the country so that your states can also have a smaller scale composting permit. If you've ever seen the typical compost permits, they're for very large scale um, facilities and require a lot of information that you might not have if you're doing it at this scale. So we really needed to change there ways of thinking in order for them to see that we have small scale operations that should be able to pass a permit process. Last but not least is operations. We're introducing a new system to the rec centers who have not been composting food ever, right? Who have not been saving food waste or knowing how to sift food waste. So you need to hire someone to train those rec centers and introduce this new programming within the existing rec centers. I think that was a little bit of oversight on our part because when we began this project, there was no line item that said who is going to train the new rec centers in order to you know, welcome them into this process and for us to do it well. So in order for this process to succeed, the rec centers and the youth and the leaders at that rec center have to comply to the program and have to be able to support this. And if they don't, then we won't have you know clean food waste to give to our partners to do that. So. The better you train people, the less, um, what's the word, the less, you know, an unintended garbage getting into your compost, essentially. The unwantable cigarette butts, all kinds of things for things that could show up in compost. You want to train people so that you don't even have to deal with that. So far, so good. We've got one year down and we've got a few years to go, but essentially we're doing a great job there. Unfortunately, I can't present on the large scale, which is the Organic Recycling Center, um, which is to be the next slide. Um, but I'm sure this presentation will be available to you all, so you'll be able to see that. But essentially, at a large scale, we're also we have an organic recycling center where we're making compost primarily out of woods and logs and grasses, manure, um, sanitary sewer overflow, no food waste. But um, I think there's possibilities there for us to expand. So thank you so much, and um, welcome any questions at the end. Thank you, Ash and Sophia. If you just go just to make sure it's on the recording, Ash's last page with their um, contact information. Awesome. So thank you, Ash. 
uh, partnerships, funding, keeping it local, supporting the community, uh, lots to talk about there. All right, so let me introduce, we have two more speakers, so very excited about um, our whole panel. So the next speaker is Luisa Robles, who's the sustainability coordinator for the Department of Public Works in Greenbelt, Maryland, which is a suburb of the Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. Uh, Luisa has been with the city since 2008 and is supporting community composting in a variety of ways. So Luisa, the mic is yours. Hi, thank you, Brenda. Um, I would like to acknowledge the fact that we are sitting on native land uh, by that used to, you know, be the um, Nakonchank land. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. And the Akakik land. So I just wanted to recognize that. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, public-private partnerships in composting here at the City of Maryland um, in City of Greenbelt. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so we encourage composting at all different levels from the, you know, small backyard composting to um, much larger composting and we try to facilitate the composting wherever we can. Next slide. So um, just like other presentations, really exciting presentations, by the way, thank you to all the other speakers. Uh, we do have a composting 101 uh, you know, workshop that uh, the city provides for residents and we tell them all about, you know, the ways of composting, including by just having a pile or having posts with wire fencing or using uh, pallets, of course, not treated wood and things like that. Um, some of the other speakers talked a lot about um, the details of their programs and we have such similar programs, but I'm going to focus on the public private partnerships. Next slide. So our first public partner, public private partnership is with the uh, backyardcomposting.org, which is headed by Doug Alexander of Cheverly. Um, so what this nonprofit does is they uh, find compost bins that have been tested that work well, and they purchase in bulk. Uh, when purchasing compost bins, one of the highest expenses is transporting transportation. So uh, what we do is we order in large quantities and we ship them all. This, this particular model is made in Canada. So we have them shipped from Canada. And then uh, what Public Works here does is we house all the bins. And whenever someone uh, wants to purchase a bin at a highly discounted price, then they contact the nonprofit and they come pick it up with us. So that's one small public part private partnership that we have with backyardcomposting.org. Another small uh, partnership we have is with the um, with CHEERS, Chesapeake Education Research Society and Arts Research and Arts Society. And we provide land for them where they have what they call the Three Sisters Gardens. And they also have small uh, composting uh, bins there or composting piles that they do. Um, so that's that's another small public private partnership. Our biggest public partner pr partnership is uh, with our green team um, and green aces. That's the advisory committee on environmental sustainability with the city of Greenbelt. It's a group of very active residents. So they found this amazing grant by Prince George's County, which is the county that we're in, and they applied to this grant with the help of public works and they obtained the grant. And so from then on, these uh, public par private partnerships started where um, they provided the money for the project, but then Public Works provided a lot of the building and the know how. So we have a couple of three bin systems. This one is at um, Spring Hill Lake Recreation Center. Um, because it's a three bin system, um, it's a hot composting system. So the group of people that work in it call them th themselves the HOTS, which is really funny. Next slide, please. Um, so what Public Works did is um, the HOTS purchased the materials and then here at Public Works, we built the system or our guys built the system. Next slide. We actually did not build the system on site, so then we had to transport it and it is really hard to transport these things. We needed like big equipment and everything to carry it. We've already done it twice. We have materials for one more. Next slide, please. 
And here's the team uh, setting up the compost bin. So what we provide in this partnership is um, the technical assistance to build a bin. We have a little um, cement pad there that you can see. Uh, we also built a shed for them. We went and purchased all of the materials that they needed, and we bring the wood chips to wood chips to the location uh, for them to do their composting. Next slide. What the volunteers do here is they have registration for the people to come over and drop off their food scraps. They weigh their food scraps. They weigh the amount of browns they're, that they're going to add. They put it in bin number one and give it a little mix. Then there's a community events where everyone brings all the materials from bin one to bin two and then from bin two to bin three. So the, the community uh, partnership is uh, the ones that does all of that. Public Works helps with bringing the chips or if the bin needs a little tweak, if uh, loose is getting you know loose, then we help uh, support that. Right here in this photo, we see uh, some people doing a final sifting of the compost and one of her residents actually came up with the system, which was really cool. Um, they uh, tried different ways of doing it and this one is the one that worked the best. So that's what we're doing now. And now it's being replicated for other communities um, in other parts. And so this is a wonderful partnership where the city provides the land and certain um, uh, expertise and help and the residents do a lot of the work, a lot of the outreach and um, they then redistribute the compost to themselves, to the ones that are providing the food scraps. Next slide. Um, this is the other three bin system, which is in front of the Aquatic and Fitness Center. As you can see, uh, the guys are now uh, bringing the, the bin that they had previously built, putting it in the location on the little uh, concrete pad. Um, this bin is used slightly differently. We take uh, food scraps from our food co-op, which is our little cooperative grocery store, and the New Deal Cafe, which is uh, another cooperative cafe. We have lots of co-ops in Greenbelt. So um, the food scraps come from the grocery store and the cafe and they get put on the first bin and they get pre-digested and then they get taken to a vermicompost location, which I will show you in a little bit. Um, and then in this location, whatever is not taken to the bins, then it gets taken to, you know, put into bin number two, bin number three for it to finish and then sift it through. And the people that participate there also get the compost. Next slide, please. Right here, we have a little bit of an example of the bin number one, where the food gets pre-digested for the worms. Right here, uh, 913 pounds of food were collected. And in 2021, 4,000 pounds of food were diverted from the landfill, just food scraps. And then in addition to that, we have you know the browns uh, with the wood chips. This is a great partnership because the little grocery store helps by separating the food scraps and putting them into buckets. And then our residents uh, that are part of the green team, uh, the huts and the wigglers, the wigglers are the ones that work on the um, warm composting. Um, they handle all of the logistics and all of the actual hard work. Next slide, please. So here we have the three uh, wigwams uh, or the warm uh, condos. So the pre-digested compost from the co-op gets brought to the worm bins and then uh, we produce vermicompost from here. The vermicompost is then distributed to, um, to, to the three sisters, three, three sisters gardens that I mentioned before in partnership with the uh, Cheers um, nonprofit. It also gets um, gifted. If you make a donation to the New Deal Cafe, you might get a little bag of vermicompost for uh, your donation. Um, also, they bring it to us, Public Works staff, and uh, to the volunteers that do the work with the wigwams. So these are our uh, little area. Uh, this area is right behind the New Deal Cafe. So it's all very centralized and, um, you know, in, in partner with the cafe and the co-op. Next slide, please. Um, here we have the example of our great volunteers that are grabbing the food scraps from the food co-op and the New Deal Cafe. They bring it to the bin, they bring it to the vermicompost. 
then they hold the vermicompost and here you see them washing all of the five gallon buckets that they use to do all of this hauling around and it's usually done uh, by foot since everything is walking distance or by bike or by little cart something like that uh, next slide um, part of the same grant included uh, vermicomposting home kits. So the, um, the huts and the wigglers bought the materials and Public Works drilled all the bins and prepared them. Um, we have been showing them at uh, festivals and different places where people might be interested. The vermicomposts are really hard to give away. We're giving them out for free and uh, people are very um, tentative about doing vermicomposting in their homes. These bins are so small that you cannot have them outside, like the three big wigwams that are outside the New Deal Cafe. Uh, about the wigwams, uh, they do have a connection to electricity because in the winter it gets really hot, I mean really cold, so we have to have heating pads for them. And in the summer when it gets really hot, we put like ice packs on them. Um, so um, those weak ones can stay outside, but these bins have to be inside because it's too small a volume for the worms to like the hot or the cold. Um, so in with the vermicompost, we still have a bunch of them. If anyone is interested that lives around this area and you want a vermicompost, let me know. Um, so we um, we help with the storing of the bins. Uh, but the grant that the volunteers wrote uh, provided the money to buy the bins. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have a, this little shed for food scraps drop off. So we also have like the different scales of backyard composting, backyard composting with a bin, community composting and food scrap drop off. That's for people that don't really have the time or know how to put in the work. They can just bring the food scraps. That little shed was constructed with another public-private partnership. Um, the uh, Green Team volunteers wrote a grant called the Jim Castles Food Co-op Award, and there's a link there if you're interested in that grant, um, to buy the materials and build uh, the little shed. And that's where now the, um, the bins are located for people to bring their food scraps to us. And we're working with Compost Crew, which is a private company that picks up the scraps and takes all of it to a really big uh, recycling facility in Prince George's County. Um, and now we're also working with Compost Crew together with a bunch of other municipalities. That's yet another public-private partnership, partnership we call Come On, Composting Municipalities Organizing Now, uh, where we're looking for small pieces of land where we can do more distributed composting closest, closer to us. So um, we're still working on that right now. We found a couple of composting locations that compost crew might be able to take advantage of, but we haven't been able to fine tune that partnership in those locations. But for this one, uh, people drop their food scraps uh, and then compost crew picks them up and takes them to the big uh, composting plant. And um, next slide, please. That's it. Thank you very much. And thank you for composting. Thanks, Louisa. I think your screen belt is such a great example of partnerships once again, not only with the community and volunteers and community and compost crew, but also local restaurant. Fabulous. So our last presenter, and then I think we'll have a good 15 minutes for Q&A. We won't be able to get to all of your questions, but we'll get to some of them. But our last presenter is Adam uh, Michaelides. He's the Compost Education Manager for Cornell Cooperative Extension in Tompkins County, New York, which he's been doing, what, two decades, taught thousands and thousands of folks how to compost. And I think what's really interesting about the training program is how it supports and leads to community composting. So Adam, the mic is yours. Great, thanks Brenda, and thanks everyone. A very interesting presentations. I'm, I'm learning a lot. So um, what sets me apart is that I come from a, a relatively rural county. Uh, there's 100,000 people in Tompkins County. And I'm really focused on education, education, education and also focused on home scale, small scale, uh, and a little bit bigger. 
Um, but I don't get into kind of the commercial or municipality part of the composting. So that's what you'll see today. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so yes, we've been around for a long time, over three decades. Um, and we were created in 1991 in response to a garbage crisis in New York State at that time. I wasn't in New York State at that time, so I don't remember it, um, but I've heard about it. Uh, the cooperative extension, um, we put knowledge to work and we're an educational kind of uh, partner with the state university, which is Cornell University. Um, and so we have a long time partnership with uh, the county recycling and materials management. This is the county department that deals with um, waste uh, and waste management. And so they have funded us since 1991 to provide compost education in this community. Um, so we are also decentralized uh, in a way that we train community members to become master composters and master composters go on to do all kinds of interesting and innovative projects. Um, and I do a lot of education too. I work in partnership with the master composters. I support them. But overall, what we're trying to do is help Tompkins County meet its waste reduction goals um, and we are trying to put knowledge to work and make people's lives in the community better. Next slide, please. So I've got some pictures to show you. Uh, we do public classes. We do a lot of education booths, like on the right, that's at a uh, plant sale, spring plant sale, where master composters and green shirts and brown hats and name tags staff booths and talk to um, people at the event for a minute or 20 minutes about their home compost efforts, what's going well, what's not going well, resources they could use. And we, you know, one person at a time, we help them compost or we help them compost better. Um, so we do that through classes, education booths. We have a home composting demo site that we maintain and often we'll have presentations or classes right in the demo site. Next slide. Some more um, on-site, you know, backyard kind of education. We would give a lot of presentations to interested groups. Uh, here we are at the pandemic. Um, the Science Center in Ithaca invited us to come and teach composting, and we did. So we give presentations to groups that are into this, the Lions Club, uh, a couple of days ago, I was at a retirement facility. You know, we'll talk to anybody. I'll talk to anybody in the community, no matter how old or how young or what part, about how they can compost. Um, bottom right, we're in a school doing education with high school students, and I staff a service called the Rot Line, where I answer follow-up questions from events, and if people are composting and they have questions or they need help or I direct them the resources. Next slide. Um, and so here's the Master Composter Program. It's quite a large part of our program. It's very important. And we, we put a lot, we invest a lot into these volunteers. Um, and uh, they, they devote a minimum of 40 hours of the year they train uh, to help with compost education. Um, and many of them do way more than that. So we train, you know, 15 plus new volunteers every year. And I have people on the roster that I can call upon from past years in excess of 100 people. It's a lot of people to know and manage and, um, you know, work with. And some are more active than others, but they get things done and they, they in a decentralized way, work in the community. Uh, next slide. Um, we do support composting in group settings or multifamily settings. We, um, we help co-ops, we help apartment complexes, and other places where people live together and they compost together. Often this happens in the garden space. If there's a community garden or an apartment complex garden, there is going to be a compost too. So we work with those sites, we help them, we help them build bins, we help them turn bins, 
we help educate their members, we support them. We don't, we're not there to do all the work, but we do a share of it uh, to make it feasible for them to, to continue to compost. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, this is a special project we, we started um, maybe about five years ago after attending one of uh, uh, ILSR's uh, workshops, um, national workshops. We got this program, Compost Learning Collaborative, where we got permission from community gardens for land. And we built, uh, Master Composters and I, built these three bin systems. Um, and, uh, you know, working with our partner, we recruited members uh, to take a training and they could come. Uh, they have the, the combination to the lock, they open the lock, they can add their food scraps, and then if they come help turn and manage compost, they can go home with finished compost. That's sort of the model. Uh, we recruit, we're kind of constantly recruiting new members. There's a lot of people come and go. Uh, we have three sites currently. Um, we have we fluctuate between a small uh, few households per site and more depending on the year. The pandemic was a you know changed things up, and altogether we've uh, I've logged the people who use the sites uh, log their amounts, and we've logged over a ton so far. Okay, next slide. Um, and this has been a real successful part of our program. Remember those education booths I was talking about? Well, you can have an education booth at a really sweet spot at your festival if you also manage the, the compost at the festival. Festival organizers love to farm out that service. So master composters are there and we juggle doing education with festival goers uh, with uh, wheeling around wagons and collecting buckets of food scraps from food vendors um, and staffing a station where uh, festival goers can bring us their stuff and we help them sort it properly. Uh, and that's an ongoing thing. So this is something that volunteers love to do and uh, we have many festivals in our area. So it's a real high point of the program. Next slide. Um, so impacts, um, I track impacts. Uh, I make estimates. They're just estimates. Um, and you know, you can see that I make the estimates based on the participation rate of home composting in our county. And surveys say time after time, a large percentage of the population composts, which is great. It's working, right? Um, and so based on average numbers for food scrap generation, yard waste generation participation, I make estimates of these numbers. I don't think they're correct, totally correct, but they're hopefully ballpark. Um, what I do have more control over is um, uh, the number of people we talk to and we count at every event. You know, we had the Ithaca Festival recently and we talked to 390 people at the Ithaca Festival. So last year, we had direct outreach with 2,000 residents and indirect outreach with more. Uh, and the master composter contribution, this is huge, right? Um, master composters put in over 1,000 volunteer hours collectively last year, and the value of that is over $30,000, which is, you know, uh, basically um, master composters sort of double our impact at least and it's decentralized to places where I would never be able to reach. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, the cost. So the funding comes from Tompkins County Recycling Materials Management. For me, the only part-time paid staff person. Um, and you know we're on the shoestring budget. Most of the funding pays for my staff time and then volunteers contribute more volunteer staff time, and I have a small budget for materials. Next slide, please. Uh, some of our bigger successes, uh, Master Composter Program, it is you know, kind of the bedrock of what we do. It's a great return on the investment. Not every volunteer pans out, but most of them do, and some of them are incredible. Um, we staff, they staff year-round events, and uh, uh, also the events, the festivals, um, and then you know all of the things we do around home compost education. 
the education booths, the public classes, the articles for the paper, the rot line, all of this kind of adds up to keeping everything flowing in the program. All right, next, we'll go on the challenges. Um, so this Compost Learning Collaborative, you know, it, it's been, you know, a bit hard going. And I actually, from this webinar, I'm thinking more, this would be better to kind of farm out to communities to manage themselves because trying to manage it from a centralized place, you know, I just don't have all the contacts of the people using those sites and it's hard to keep up. Uh, it also takes staff time to, um, to maintain and make sure things are being done properly. Uh, so it's just been a little bit of a challenge. I think our home education is sort of working better uh, the group sites, sustainability of the sites over time is always tricky. You know, there's it's a transient population. It's a college town. People come, people go. The people who are trained and know how to do things leave. So that's always a problem. And then I wish I had a scale and I could measure every scrap of food that has been composted in everybody's house countywide, but you just can't do it. So I just have to make estimates and... Um, I wish I had better numbers. Okay, next slide. Um, all right, and then there's off-site composting is through Tompkins County Recycling. There are drop-off locations. They, they track drops and amounts diverted. Next slide. And this all goes out to Cayuga Compost in Trumansburg, New York. They have windrows, they make finished compost, and they have a New York State DC permit. Next slide. That's our website on the bottom left. That's my contact bottom right. We have um, info sheets and videos for the public and for anybody in the country. So thank you for your time and your attention. Look forward to your questions. Thanks, Adam. And I think what we've tried to showcase here with the five different local governments is that, you know, you could be on a shoestring budget and not have a lot of resources, but maybe start with a master composter program or uh, backyard, um, you know, home composting program, a rebate program, providing access to land. Uh, Sophia, we can stop sharing your screen if we could bring all of our presenters, turn your video cams on, and un um, I think we can just spend the last 13 minutes we have um, with some of our Q uh, questions. We have a lot of questions that came in, so I we won't get to all of them, but if, if you all could keep your answers as brief as possible, we'll get we'll get to more, obviously. So uh, there were a number of questions around budget and where your money comes from and what kind of investment. Adam, I think you addressed that a little bit, but um, and and you know I think Louisa, you're another example of you know maybe you know you have the contract with compost crew but you're using your existing resources with your staff to build bins or the concrete pads or um, the equipment to move it the other thing you mentioned the heating for the worm bins but i don't think you mentioned that that public works actually did the electrical work for that yeah. so there's little things that public works or government agencies can do that aren't a lot of investment but anyway let me start with you krista is and, and again brief just anything you can say about the actual investment dollars budget for this work you're doing? Well, the money comes from tons disposed at the landfill. So it's, I think it's like nine, around $9 per ton. And so that's what funds the programs and that's what funds my position. And so it's not a general fund um, like some other counties in the cities. And so, and that's why when we work with community gardens and whoever to, make sure that it's um, focused on waste reduction and composting. And um, yeah, then we have different contracts with, um, we used to have master uh, composters do the workshops, but like you were saying that some are great and some are not. And so I didn't wanna rely on people flaking and things like that. So I do have a contract with uh, three different instructors to do the workshops and I provide support. And um, then we do have some, uh, projects that Public Works does, like they were building some three bin systems. And for use of, those of you who have done it, those are actually, they take a long time. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's uh, basically our funding. And Sunny, thank you, Krista. Sunny, you mentioned, you know, a grant that you got. What happens 
in Albany, you know, when that grant money, how are you going to sustain those programs after the grant runs out? And anything you can say about the actual dollar figure of these programs, I think folks would love to hear that. Oh, you're muted, Sonny. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, the grant, the current grant was for 225,000 in the DEC uh, as a three-year grant. Um, but the city has committed uh, funds to these programs in perpetuity. So we've allocated it in our recycling budget, which um, which used to get taken out pretty bad by the uh, cost of you know processing recyclables. But now it's a little bit lower and we're starting to make a little bit of money on some things. So we have money in the budget to keep these going. But there's also another grant now um, for infrastructure from the DEC for composting facilities. Um, focused mainly on uh, also environmental justice communities. So yeah, most of our funding comes from the grants and then what the city's put aside. And Ash, does Philly, you know, what, what is your source of, of funding for Farm Philly? Do you have to raise, you know, and then for the community, the composting mm -hmm. you're doing, do you have yeah, to raise we, money every year through grants? Yeah, we do, we do have to raise money every year for now. And so the, Community compost grant or community compost project, the small scale one. We got a grant from the USDA, it's the Community Compost and Food Waste Reduction Cooperative Agreement. So the USDA, uh, I'm sure many of you have noticed since 2020 has been, even this year, it just got announced. There's millions of dollars pouring into agriculture projects and composting as a part of that. And then of course the PA Department of Ag um, has uh, got farm bill dollars and then created a um, urban infrastructure grant. So we got a grant from it as well um, and, and, and other funders. So there is a risk of course to taking money from you know these grants or from funders but essentially with the bins we, we build them so big and indestructible so they last a long time and so really we're just maintaining them uh, but once they fully break down it you know it would be a challenge for us to figure out how to find the funds to replace them. Yeah, and Sunny, I think your example of, you know, you got a grant, but now it's going to be funded by the city because, you know, it's nice to use the grant to showcase what's happening and what can happen. And Louisa, I think you mentioned that the city wrote letters of support for nonprofits and community groups to write their grants. So there's another thing cities could be doing in this public-private partnership space. Anything, Louisa, that you can share about the actual you know, investment in dollars that your right. city has spent on this? So we have a little bit of budget that we use uh, for supporting these initiatives, but mostly the money has come from grants that we've written in conjunction with uh, residents or that nonprofits write and then we uh, support them in, you know, with letters of support. Um, so we do have a little bit of our city budget dedicated to that but the big bulk of it does come from grants. There's also Chesapeake Bay uh, fund grants that we apply to, uh, that we can get uh, materials, the smaller materials for stuff like light, like, like the buckets or things like that, um, that, that are recurrent. So grants that come around every year or so. Um, so that's that's kind of where, where we do it. And, and some um, in staff, um, like in kind time from our staff. Uh, we squeeze projects here and there. So that's yeah. So still on the money, there's a few questions just on the on the you know what you pay and the flow of money. Um, first um, th there were some questions around whether anybody, you know, do, do residents or people have to pay, you know, to participate um, uh, you know in any of the programs. So are you recouping any cost that way? Anybody want to say anything about that? maybe sunny for the curbside? Do people have um, to pay in at all? Yeah, so the out of the three options, uh, the only one that residents would have to pay for is the curbside collection. I think I think it's like $20 a month, 15 to 20, something like that. But in terms of the backyard composting program, we give them all the materials for free. Um, and then the drop-off obviously is free to use. Any of the drop-offs and we give them a kitchen scraps bin. So there is no no cost. 
to Adam to do the master composter program, do people have to pay to register, or is that a, do you? How do you select your fifteen to eighteen people? Yeah, they, there's an application process, and there is a training deposit that people pay up front, and then when they fulfill their minimum number of volunteer hours for the year, I refund it to them. So even that's a free program. Uh, if people do their volunteer time, if they drop out, I keep the money. And it's not, and and it's it not 40, very much. 40 hours, right? Yeah. yeah and Ash, hours. we have a question for you. Does the city pay Bennett compost too, or is it just kind of here's the prop, here's the land? And yeah, yeah from my recollection, we don't. It is a, it's a part, partnership in that way. So Bennett has a cost. Right, so for them to go pick up the material from the rec centers, process the material, and deliver the material, all of that is a cost, whether it's staff time, gas, all this stuff. In return, we give them the utilities, the land, et cetera. And also we're giving them inputs. So that food that they're recycling from the, or from the rec centers is also going into their private business as well, even though we're getting a portion of that back. So yeah, it's, a, it's essentially like a, a mutual relationship, if you will. Um, and, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, and I'll reach back out to you if I'm wrong, but I don't think our, we, we don't pay them. Okay, so I'm going to ask each of you this. I know some of you already addressed your challenges, but if you had, you know, one or two tips or lessons learned for other local government, um, uh, what what would they be? And Ash, I'll just start with you. I think, I forget what you said, partnerships for the win. I love that. <laughs> if you want to expand about yeah, any yeah. other tip. Yeah, absolutely. Just really quick, I will say that um, the federal government being interested in composting is a relatively new phenomenon. So we've mm -hmm. been like literally scraping by for the last decade. And so now we're starting to see, um, so we have this very, in Philly, we have a very much so <laughs> like do a, li a lot with a little mentality. Um, and so I will say that we really encourage folks to use partnerships. If there's other builders, and there's lots of builders in your community, in your towns, that are nonprofits that have youth do builds, that have returning returning residents um, do builds, have, have those folks partner with you because they have to get work done. They have to give these folks work to do. Why not build yeah. cans and compost bins, right? So that's a huge thing for me. And then second, I would say, um, operationally, this is like insider baseball, but when you're training residents to do it on a community level, so I can't speak to the residential level, so I love hearing about everybody else's like bins in the backyard. One day we'll get there, but we're just doing community oriented. So, um, is that each of those sites really do need to think about operationally how they want to run their sites and they need to be trained about what that means, like what cooperative models mean or what. Um, I've seen folks just take any waste. I've seen residents walk across the street with waste from lunch and throw it in a compost bin. And I was like, oh, I just love seeing that. But not every site can do that. Not every site can take in whatever waste comes to their front door. So you don't want people to be overwhelmed by all the greens in the, in the city. And you have to educate the residents of your city to know that they can't just show up to these sites. There has mm -hmm. to be planned hours and there has to be an operation model, an operating model. And there should be leaders too. So we require each site to have site leaders. So no matter what, we know there's at least two people that we can depend upon to answer our emails. It's not yeah. just we're yeah. emailing 15 people and hopefully one person gets back to us. So and Ash, we, we here at ILSR, we couldn't agree more with you on the importance of training as a foundation for, yeah, I think no matter what size your composting operation is, Having a trained operator is a key to success. Anyway, let's go around again. So, Krista, I'll go to you. Any tips for replication for local government? Uh, um, I don't know. I guess uh, support from like upper management, and um, I've always had great support. And uh, yeah, working with the the community, and I guess uh, just allowing staff time. And, I know some of you are part time, and so that can be challenging. And luckily, we do have staff. Well, I'm the one mainly working on compost, but um, I don't know. It is really partnerships with all the gardens, and um, yeah. So, good. Louisa, I agree with everything that Ash and Krista said. I think that having your volunteers, uh, having them 
having some leaders that know how to train the other people, of course, having support from the top and then writing the grants to see where the money is coming from. But we would not be able to do any of this, even if we have the money, if we didn't have the volunteers and the trained people and the trained people that train the others. Um, and so that management of that logistic, I think it's required. Adam, I'm gonna go to you since Louisa ended on training. <laughs> oh, I love it, I love it. I, I like all the focus on education. Um, yes, it's uh, inspiring everyone, especially the dedicated master composters and empowering them to follow their dreams and do the projects that are a little nutty, but will, um, you know, educate others in their All right, Sunny, we're at time and we want to run a quick poll. So for those of you about to hang up, don't, because we want to get your feedback on whether we should continue this webinar series. So it'll just take 30 more seconds, but Sunny, any tips for, um, replication to other local governments? Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with everything that my uh, co-panelists said, but one thing that really helped me in the beginning is when I first got to Albany, I just went to as many local zero waste meetings and community group meetings and all the people who probably didn't, historically didn't feel like the government was listening or cared and making myself visible helped me kind of parlay what their vision was into something real with my higher ups. So I was able to become kind of the middleman between the local nonprofits and then my supervisors. I feel like that's kind of important because there's a yeah. big disconnect there everywhere. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Well, a round of applause for, I'm sure everybody who's still attending, we still have a hundred people live. Thank you for being to the end. So um, let's just run this poll real quick quickly and then while we're doing that I'll just tell everybody that when you uh, leave the webinar a survey is gonna pop up and we do encourage you to participate in the survey there's some demographic um, go ahead and, and participate in this quick poll while I'm talking uh, but the survey we have a few demographic questions we're just trying to meet our um, equity and diversity inclusivity goals here at the Institute and diversify reach different audiences. So we would really appreciate if you could participate in that. In addition, there's questions about the webinar itself and, and uh, the content. So that'll pop up as soon as we end this. But let's, we have 99% of you or 78% of you have voted. So, and it looks like 99% of you have said, yes, please continue this webinar series. So we will consider that. There is just so many great examples of, um, of programs we could be spotlighting and we look forward to doing more of this. So again, thank you presenters and thank you for all of our attendees and um, look forward to seeing how your programs continue and grow. All right, take care everybody.